take, please take your copy of God's Word and turn with me to Philippians chapter 2, beginning at verse 19. Philippians 2, beginning at verse 19. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon so that I too may be cheered by news of you. For I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. For they all seek their own interest, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know Timothy's proven worth, how as a son with a father he has served with me in the gospel. I hope therefore to send him just as soon as I see how it will go with me. And I trust in the Lord that shortly I myself will come also. I have thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, and your messenger and minister to my need. For he has been longing for you all and has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill near to death, but God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I am the more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again, that I may be less anxious. So receive him in the Lord with all joy, and honor such men, for he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. Let's pray together. Lord, we give thanks to you that you and your goodness have granted us your word. And we pray, Lord, that you would, by your grace, work in our hearts through your word today. Teach us the truth of who you are and what you have done. God, we pray that you would work by your spirit to convict us of what is true and right, to show us your goodness, to lead us in following more obediently after Christ. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Well, this past Sunday, I'm not sure what's going on here. Uh, this past Sunday, uh, it was good to have Dr. Timothy George here with us uh, as he was uh, filling the pulpit, preaching to us about Barabbas and how Christ took our place. An excellent sermon with fantastic truth uh, in it. Uh, but one of the things that uh, I heard a couple of times by some friends of mine here in the congregation afterwards was just how much they enjoyed the length of the sermon. <laughs> and I think it was a not so subtle hint for me to emulate his example of the length. Now here's something that you need to understand about preachers though. When we don't get an opportunity to preach, there's like this preacher energy that hasn't been able to be expended. So I didn't get to preach last week, so I've got like 40 minutes extra built up. So you should just be prepared. I promise that you will get out today before lunch, at least. But turning to the passage, the text that I read to you just a few moments ago, I believe is one that most of us probably haven't heard a lot of sermons from. In fact, as I was preparing for this and just doing a little research, I've noticed that quite a few of my preaching heroes haven't spent any time in this text here. Because at first glance, it seems like there's not a lot that's going on. I mean, we don't get a lot of exhortation from Paul. He doesn't say, do this or don't do that. Rather, it just seems like he is telling us about who is going to be visiting. Epaphroditus is there and Timothy is going to be coming later. And so it just seems almost like a travel narrative of those who are going to be visiting. But there actually is a lot more that is taking place in this passage than maybe first appears. Because if you remember with me what Paul has been doing in this book so far, as he has been laying out some specific challenges to the congregation. He has been telling them things like, you are to live worthy of the gospel. Live as citizens of the kingdom, not just citizens of this world. And he's been telling them to be servants of one another and to love one another the way that Christ set the example 
for us. Do everything without grumbling or complaining. And so he's been laying out these very high charges to the congregation about what they are to do. So really what Paul is doing here is he's listing Timothy and Epaphroditus. He's not just saying, hey, these are men who are going to be visiting you. Rather, what he is doing is he is holding up these two men as examples of what he has been telling the congregation to do. These are men who you can look to who are living worthy of the gospel. These are men who are serving in a way that puts others before themselves. These are men who are serving the Lord without grumbling or complaining. So essentially, he is holding them up as examples for them to emulate. And in the same way, the text is holding these men up for us as well, that we would see their life and we would follow the example that they have been giving, not just to Philippi, but to us as well. I think probably all of us can look back on our own lives and we can see how people's examples have impacted us. I think about a youth pastor who had a major impact on my own life. Now, I know that I sat through a lot of teachings that he did, a lot of Wednesday nights and sermons that he delivered. But to be honest, I don't know if I can remember a single teaching that he gave. But what I can remember still clearly to this day is the example that he showed. An example of a heart that seemed to love Jesus more than anything else. An example of someone who trusted in the word no matter what. And there may be people who you think of right now who come to your mind as those kinds of godly examples that you still remember today and that you're still looking up to. Well, in essence, Paul is saying, here are men who can serve as examples for you. Now, before we really get into these men and what is going on in the text, let me just give you a reminder of some of the background about what's been taking place. Remember, Paul's in prison in Rome. And he's been there for a while. And he's confident, he believes, that he's going to be released from prison at some point. But Paul is in Rome in a time where Nero is emperor. And we all know that Nero wasn't exactly fully sane. So Paul didn't know how everything was going to turn out. But because the Philippians loved Paul so much, when they heard that he was imprisoned, they took up a collection for him to give to him to help meet his needs. Now, this is a pretty massive undertaking to do because they didn't have any easy way to get money to him. There's no Venmo in getting money to Paul. And so in order for that to happen, they take up a collection of actual physical money and then they have to take that several hundred miles over a road. And then they have to go a couple hundred miles more over the sea. And then when they land, they have to go a couple hundred miles more to get to Rome. And on all the way, it's a dangerous journey where there might be thieves on the road or the danger of shipwreck as they're traveling by ship. And so all this time, they are intent on getting this gift to Paul. Now, one of the people they send to carry that gift is Epaphroditus. Now, more than likely from what we understand about him, that he probably grew up as a pagan, an unbeliever, then came to faith in Christ at some point, and then he is probably serving as just a layman in the church. This is an apostle. This is maybe what we would call just an average man in the pew. And so Epaphroditus goes with several men to take this gift to Paul. Now, something happens along the way, and we don't know exactly what it is, but Epaphroditus falls ill, essentially deadly ill. He's at the point of death, but he is so insistent on helping Paul and ensuring that this gift gets there that, that he rallies and he, by God's grace, is able to go to visit Paul. And, and so now Paul has gotten the money from Epaphroditus. And if you can imagine being imprisoned so far away from this church, and then one day, somebody who you know, beloved to you, shows up and brings this gift to you. You can imagine just how overwhelming that must have been for Paul, how joyous he must have been when he received that. And so now he is sent Epaphroditus back to the church 
because they're worried about Epaphroditus. They've heard that he's been sick. And so he's sending this letter, this letter to the Philippians with Epaphroditus back with the gift. And he's telling them that here's Epaphroditus and soon I'm gonna send Timothy to you as well. And so this is where we pick up in the text. And I mentioned to you that what we're doing here is we are seeing Paul hold up these two men as examples for us to emulate. And so what I wanna do is I wanna share with you four examples of characteristics, four characteristics that we can see from these men that we can learn for ourselves as well. So characteristic number one that we learn is loving God's people. Paul points to how both Epaphroditus and Timothy love God's people, the church. I mean, I want you to just listen again to what Paul writes about Timothy. For I have no one like him. This is in verse 20. I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. For they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. And so Paul here uses a word for being concerned that's a pretty strong word. It's saying that Timothy is almost anxious for them. He has such a deep desire and love for them, wanting to see them thrive in Christ. Now, this is in contrast to the people that Paul sees around him there in Rome. In verse 21, he says that all the rest of the people just seek their own interest, not those of Jesus Christ. Now, can you imagine that? Here's Paul there in Rome. And what he looks around is seeing all these folks who are just concerned about themselves, maybe even some of the Christians that he's talking about. But he looks at Timothy. This is a guy who isn't concerned just for himself. He is one who has the interest of Christ above everything else. Now, let's think for just a minute. What are the interests of Christ? Christ came for his people, right? Christ came to this earth to call out his sheep, right? So then isn't it the case that Christ's interests are his people? And so Timothy then has the same interests of Christ, and that is God's people. And so Paul is saying, have that kind of love and concern for the people of God. But then he also points out this same kind of love in Epaphroditus. Listen to verse 26 again. For he has been longing for you all and has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. So, you know, Epaphroditus there with Paul in Rome, he has been almost at the point of death, but God heals him. But Epaphroditus is so concerned for the people at Philippi that he's worried that they were worried about him. And so he's got to get information back to them to let them know, hey, I'm okay. God has healed me. So he has a worry and a concern for them that goes above himself. So here's what Paul is doing. He is showing us just how deeply Paul, how deeply Timothy and Epaphroditus care for the body of Christ. And then shouldn't it be the case as we look at God's word that that should be our heart as well? Because in God's ordering of things, we see so often that our heart should be God first, then others, and then ourselves. I mean, isn't that what we see with Jesus? You know, Jesus, obedience to the Father, but even in what we read in Philippians chapter 2, I mean, he is taking on the form of a servant, emptying himself, going to the point of death, even death on a cross is what Paul says. And so think even then about what Jesus' great commandment is. Love God and then love others. And over and over again, we get statements from Jesus where he prays, Father, not my will, but your will be done. The last shall be first. The Son of Man didn't come to be served, but to serve. We see this heart in Jesus. Paul says, I see this heart in Epaphroditus and Timothy. I want to see this heart in you also of putting others first. Now let's think just a moment about what this might look like practically, just just very basic ways of putting feet to this. I think the the first step of loving God's people comes with being with God's people. There should be a priority of commitment to being with the people of God. Now, 
that takes its first step in this gathering that we have right now. This has to be a priority gathering for the people of God. Because this is the time where we have set aside that we focus on the word and on prayer together and singing together, worship together as the people of God. So this is kind of our starting point of commitment to one another. And then when the church gathers at other times, we're committing ourselves to gathering at those times. I think especially of Wednesday nights. I cannot describe just how encouraging and good those times of prayer are. It is a refreshment to my soul every Wednesday. When we gather together and we sing and we're reading the word together and then we're just praying together, there is something that happens in my life that's different after that because I've been with the people of God. And this is what God does. As we come together more, our heart for one another grows more and more. But here's the thing our connection to one another and commitment to one another must, absolutely must, extend beyond the walls of this building so that our lives are intersecting more and more so that we become more and more united. You know, there, I I share this periodically and I can't remember if I've shared it from the pulpit before, but, but there is a word that I've come up with to describe what our lives should be look like, should look like as Christians. Now, everybody's eating spaghetti, right? We all know what it's like to eat spaghetti and how all the noodles intertwine and everything. I think that we need to increase the spaghettification of the church. (laughs) And by, by that, I mean that our lives should look a lot like those noodles. There should be a whole lot of intersecting of our lives going on, not just touching at one place in this room, but in lots of other times, lots of other places. And what we find then, as we do that, our love for one another actually grows because we are spending time together. And so that's what we're seeing held up for us, that kind of sincere love for the people of God. Will you love God's people that way, giving ourselves to one another? So that's characteristic number one. Characteristic number two is proven character. Proven character. So listen to verse 22 again. But you know Timothy's proven worth. How as a son with a father, he has served with me in the gospel. His proven worth. Now, that word that's used there for proven worth is one that's not overly common in the New Testament, but has a great picture to it. It, The word is used to describe something that has been tested and be found to be true or worthwhile or pure. It it could be used of a soldier to describe a soldier who has been tested on the battlefield and be found to be a good soldier. It it could be used to describe a metal that was tested to ensure that it was pure. Gold then, just like now, had great value and it needed to be tested to ensure that it was pure gold, not mixed with other metals. And if it was found to be pure, it would be declared this word, proven. Now, Paul says that Timothy has been proven true in his character because he has labored for years with the apostle Paul. Timothy was there when they were threatened and run out of a town. Timothy was there when hardships came on them, but he didn't turn away. He clung to Christ. He clung to the body of Christ. He clung to the gospel. Timothy was there faithfully ministering week in, week out, month in, month out, year in, year out. And all that time, Paul could say, I've watched him. He has not turned away at all. He is proven. You know, the Christian life is not a hundred yard dash. The Christian life is a marathon that extends to the end of our days. And in this marathon of the Christian life, you will have countless opportunities and times where you can waver. Countless temptations that will come upon you. Countless points where you can lose your hope, lose your faithfulness. And Paul is holding up Timothy as an example for us. And so when the temptations come, when you feel those temptations moving against your heart, Will you prove your character? Will you turn away from that temptation and say, no, I belong to Christ? 
When the trials and difficulties come, the hardships that are inevitable in this life, will you prove your character by standing firm and trusting in Christ? Will you be like Job and say, though he slay me, yet will I trust him? Will you be proven? But what about more mundane, normal things of life? I mean, we can think about the big once-in-a-lifetime events that might come where we're going to say, I'm going to stand firm in that. But it's often in the normal, mundane, day-to-day life that we sometimes struggle. The times where the busyness of life just seems to be almost overwhelming. And maybe everything's going fine, but it's just constant. You cannot seem to keep your head above water. When those busy times are there, will you keep proven character? Will you ensure that your focus is unwavering on Christ? Will you be driven by Christ and the gospel rather than the circumstances of your life? Whether it's the busyness of life or the trials of life or whatever that comes in your life, will you be proven true? Let us look to Timothy as an example to exhort us and encourage us on toward that kind of faithfulness, proven true. All right, so again, thinking about these two men, the characteristics of godliness that we see in them, you know, we're seeing loving God's people, that we might do that also. But, but then we're seeing a proven character. We want to be men and women with that kind of proven character. And then third characteristic is advancing the gospel. That we would be, like Timothy and Paul, people who are focused on advancing the gospel. Listen again, verse 22, about what Paul says about Timothy. But you know Timothy's proven worth, How as a son with a father, he has served with me in the gospel. Paul is holding up Timothy as this example. And the word that he used there for Timothy serving in the gospel is a pretty strong word of Timothy giving his life toward it. Now, it's easy maybe for us to just quickly glance over what Paul says about Timothy here. Okay, yeah, we see that he served for the sake of the gospel. But the people in Philippi knew Timothy. They had seen him. They had seen his example. They knew what he was like. They knew that Timothy traveled with Paul on these different missionary journeys. They knew that Timothy had experienced the times of being run out of towns. They knew that when Paul had to leave Berea because of a riot, Timothy actually stayed to minister there. They knew that Timothy was the guy that Paul sent to Thessalonica to teach the believers. They knew about Paul and Timothy being together on the way to Jerusalem. They knew that Timothy had left everything, in essence, to advance the gospel to those who had never heard it. So Timothy saw himself as a servant, or a different way to translate it, as a slave of the gospel. I don't think it's any coincidence that Paul uses this word to describe Timothy's commitment to the gospel because it's the same word that is used to describe Jesus in his being committed as a servant, coming as a servant. But you and I, we're not this apostolic delegate like Timothy is, but you and I have essentially the same kind of servant calling to be given to serving for the sake of the gospel. And I can't help but think what Paul is doing here is holding up Timothy to the church at Philippi and saying, see how he served the gospel. You be like him also. That example is here for us of how we would be servants of the gospel. And it's a reminder to us of the desperate condition of so much of the world. Today, even 2,000 years after the coming of Christ, nearly half of the world's population lives in areas where they have little to no access to the gospel. Thousands of people groups that are considered unreached. But when it comes to thinking about advancing the gospel, maybe it's easy for us to think about that in terms of places that are out there. 
those places that have the unreached people groups. But let's bring it even a little closer to home for us. Looking at the statistics about Jackson here, where we are, the the statistics vary, but the average shows that 50% of the population is religious, however you want to define that. But let's consider that every single person in this city who considers themselves religious is a regenerate Christian. Now, that's absolutely unlikely. But that would mean that every other person in this city is without Christ. At best, every other one. And we all know that those statistics are far higher than that. We must be people who are given to being servants of the gospel. You know, we're in a time of the Christian calendar where it helps us to remember the seriousness of the gospel and the necessity of the gospel going forth. And because we're just two weeks out from Easter right now. And in the culture in which we live, a very um, Christian-saturated, Bible-saturated culture, Uh, the subject of Easter still holds a lot of sway. Everybody around us knows what Easter is and uh, why we have Easter. Uh, They may not believe in Jesus, but they understand something about Easter. It presents to us an opportunity, something of a gospel opportunity, because there is built into a calendar that all the rest of the people around us know that we are celebrating something. And there's an opportunity for me and you to talk about Christ with our friends, our neighbors, our classmates, people on our ball team, because it's already built into what we're doing. We can talk about Easter. But beyond that, there is a potential that we might even be able to have people who would come to this place who otherwise wouldn't be willing to. There are two calendar days that unbelievers might be willing to come most often to a church building. And that's Christmas and Easter. And so we have an opportunity in a couple of weeks that maybe some of your friends, some of your teammates might be willing to come with you to an Easter service. Now we're going to be here celebrating the resurrection of Jesus. We're going to be joining together and proclaiming that truth. But at the same time, the gospel is going to be preached. And there's an opportunity for those people to hear. So at the end of our time together this morning, we are going to give you just a little tool that you can use to invite people to our Easter service. Just a flyer, that a little postcard that you can use to hand out to your neighbor and say, come join us at our Easter service. Somebody that you've been praying for, somebody that you've been trying to get to know, this is an easy way to do that. And we've sent out 5,000 invitations um, to the surrounding 5,000 homes in this city. But this is an opportunity for you to do it personally to invite people to come because we want to be servants of the gospel. We want to reach out with the good news of Jesus Christ and let that be a driving passion for us. I'm reminded of what Charles Spurgeon said. One of the greatest soul winners of the probably the past thousand years, he said, if sinners be damned, at least let them leap to hell over our dead bodies. If they perish, let them perish with our arms wrapped about their knees, imploring them to stay. If hell must be filled, let it be filled in the teeth of our exertions and let not one go unwarned and unprayed for. Let that be our heart. Now, let me speak to two different groups of people in here right now. I want to focus on those who are the younger in here. And I'll let you decide which category you fall in. So it's going to be the younger and then the older. You make that determination. Now, as regard to those who are younger, everything that this world speaks to you right now is to live for this world, to get everything that you can out of it, get the best education you can, get the best career you can, so you can make the most money that you can, live it up, get the most that you can, aim high, achieve your dreams. But what I want to tell you is that it is possible to gain everything in the world and then you miss what is most important. Jesus never told us that our main aim is to get the best education, to get the best job, be great at a sport, to earn a lot of money and achieve your dreams. None of those things are necessarily wrong in and of themselves. But what Jesus did give us is a commission that says to make disciples, 
to give yourself to this. Those of you who are younger in here, don't buy into what the world is telling you about living for. Live for Christ and for the advancement of the gospel. While you are young, give your heart to it so that that's your heart all the rest of your life. Now, the other category here, whatever you consider yourself to be in, there is something that happens as we get older. We tend to lose our flair for the radical nature of following after Jesus. We tend to get more comfortable in this world. And we tend to live more and more for this world. Church, let us not be more and more attracted to this world, but let us be more and more burdened for this world. Let us spend ourselves for the advancement of the gospel here and to the ends of the earth. No more delay. No more delay in reaching out to our one. Let's do that. Let's look for opportunities to go on mission. You've been thinking about it. You've got opportunities laid out for you. Go and do it. Pray for the Lord to give you those opportunities to advance the gospel. One thing I know is that God delights to answer the prayers of his people. And if we pray for more opportunity to get the gospel to people around us, don't we think God will answer that prayer? Let us be people like Timothy, servants of the gospel. That's the third characteristic, advancing the gospel. It brings us to our fourth characteristic, which flows out of the third. Fourth characteristic we learn from these two men is giving your all. Giving your all. So Timothy obviously gave himself and servant to the gospel and mission. But I want you to listen to what Paul writes about Epaphroditus again, picking up in verse 29. So receive him, Epaphroditus, in the Lord with all joy and honor such men. For he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. As I mentioned, there was something that happened to Epaphroditus as he was on the way bringing this gift to Paul. God, it seems, miraculously healed him, rescued him. And so now Epaphroditus is going back to the church there at Philippi. Here's Paul's point. Epaphroditus risked his life to minister to Paul. But Epaphroditus wasn't an apostle. It doesn't seem that he's a pastor or an elder. Rather, he is one of the laymen in the congregation, a man in the pew. So Paul's not holding up some apostle for us as an example. He's holding up a man who is there, part of the church, saying, look, here's an example for you of someone who gave everything, was willing to give everything for the sake of following Jesus. So church, I want to be really explicit, really clear in what I say next. Jesus has not called us to a life of living for ourselves. That is not the call that we have. In fact, Paul holds up Jesus as the example where Jesus emptied himself and gave himself as a servant for us. One of the people who has been the most encouraging to me about how we don't live for this world, we don't live for this life, but rather we give everything for the cause of Christ, is a man by the name of C.T. Studd. C.T. Studd was a wealthy Englishman, born into a wealthy family, uh, became very famous uh, at the late 1800s um, as a cricket player. But as he was rising to fame with all his family's wealth, the Lord began to do this just gracious work in his heart. And he eventually just left all of that fame, left all the wealth that he had, basically sold the things that he had, gave away his inheritance, and ended up serving as a missionary, first in China, then in India, and finally in the Congo in Africa. And he says things that remind me to not live for this world but rather to give myself for the cause of Christ. Here, here's a few things that he wrote. He said, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Jesus will last. Another place he writes, let us not glide through this world and then slip quietly into heaven 
without having blown the trumpet loud and long for our Redeemer, Jesus Christ. Let us see to it that the devil will hold a thanksgiving service in hell when he gets the news of our departure from the field of battle. One of my favorite quotes is what comes next. Too long we have been waiting for one another to begin. The time of waiting is past. The hour of God has struck, war is declared. In God's holy name, let us arise and build. The God of heaven, he will fight for us as we for him. We will not build on the sand, but on the bedrock of the sayings of Christ and the gates of minions of hell shall not prevail against us. Should such men as we fear, before the world, I before the sleepy, lukewarm, family, faithless, namby-pamby Christian world, we will dare to trust our God. We will venture our all for him. We will live and we will die for him and we will do it with his joy unspeakable, singing aloud in our hearts. We will a thousand times sooner die trusting only our God than live trusting in man. I can tell you from my years of following Jesus, it is worth it to give our all for the sake of following Christ. It is worth it, church. There may be some of you in here who you have been wrestling with what the direction of your life is going to be about. Paul tells us, look to Timothy and look to Epaphroditus. Let your life not be about you, but it be about the one who bought you. Let your life be about the cause of advancing the gospel. And maybe some of you are thinking about whether God is calling you to a life maybe of mission. What I tell you is it is worth it to give yourself for the cause of Christ. Some of you, God may be leading at some point to reach out to certain people and share the good news of Jesus with them, and you've been wavering. Don't waver any longer. Give yourself in the cause of Christ. Maybe other, there are other things that the Spirit is just urging on you, and you've been wavering about whether to follow. I tell you, it is worth it to follow in obedience to Christ. So looking at these men, Timothy and Epaphroditus, Paul says, here are examples for you. My hope for me and my hope for you is that there would be people who would then be able to look at our lives and say, here's an example of someone who loves the body of Christ. Here's an example of someone who's advancing the gospel. Here's an example of someone who is giving their all. Would it be that you and I would so give ourselves that others could look at you and say, there's an example. Follow that person as they're following Christ. Let's pray. Oh, Lord God, we thank you for your word. And we thank you for the examples that have been given in your word. Timothy and Epaphroditus. And we thank you, God, for the examples of men and women who you've placed in our own lives that we look to and see how they deeply loved the body of Christ, how they were committed to the gospel, how they were committed to giving their all. And so thank you, God, how you use those examples to spur us on to love and good deeds, spur us on to not live for this world, but to live for Christ. And so, God, I pray that you would work by your spirit to continue pressing in on us, to shape us so that we would be those men and women of proven character that others could look to as we follow Christ. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.